Hi, this is Lori Milroy, National Security Correspondent for Kurdistan 24 in Washington, D.C. And we're here today to speak with Minister Safin Dezai, Head of the Foreign Relations Department of the Kurdistan Regional Government. Welcome, Mr. Dezai. Thank you. This is your first trip to Washington in your capacity as Head of the Foreign Relations Department. How has it gone? I must say it has been quite a busy schedule, extremely interesting. And I can say that uh, by concluding all the meetings, uh, I am somewhat encouraged by what I have seen and what I have heard. Well, you've had a lot of meetings. I suppose one of the things that would have been on your schedule, on the top of your agenda, would have been the situation in Iraq. Um, what did you tell U.S. officials was happening in Iraq? Indeed, uh, a preview of, uh, an overview rather, of, of the situation. Uh, in Kurdistan as a whole, um, the uh, new cabinet and, and the um, program that the cabinet has to better the, the situation in Kurdistan in terms of economy, uh, attracting foreign investment, reforms, uh, and also to uh, the, the, the level of dialogue that has been uh, established with Baghdad to try and find solutions in resolving pending issues with Baghdad. And on Baghdad file, of course, uh, the recent uh, demonstrations and the concerns that we all have that this demonstration, which started um, peacefully, but unfortunately it has uh, turned violent. So these were more or less the framework of our uh, discussions and our views expressed on these developments and the concerns that we have. And one of the things that one hears is that some people in Iraq, they want to change the Iraqi constitution. Is, is that a concern of yours? Um, you see, there has to be um, some uh, explanation and um, clarity on that. Uh, the fact that the constitution has not been properly implemented and it has been violated, it has led Iraq to a degree to the present situation. There is no specific part of the Constitution or article in the Constitution which prevents the government in providing water, uh, health and education services. So the Constitution is not at fault uh, whereby the government has failed in uh, providing basic needs and services to the people. Um, it has been politicized. Uh, definitely amendment of the Constitution, there is a mechanism in doing so. And if there, there can be certain reforms which can better the lives of the Iraqis and to promote democracy further, we will support it. But there, I think there's some concern that the Constitution could, changes to the Constitution could infringe on the autonomy that the Kurdistan regional government enjoys now and on Kurdish rights. Is that a concern of yours? Uh, sadly, uh, we have heard some political leaders and groups and individuals who advocate for a totally new constitution uh, and uh, with the past experience and, and, and uh, the political lines that these people have adopted, it seems that they feel uh, Kurdistan and the people of Kurdistan have too much rights that is stipulated in the constitution. So that means undermining the rights of people of Kurdistan and the federal structure of Iraq and the new identity of Iraq, the political identity of Iraq being a democratic and federal Iraq, which we all fought during the opposition years uh, in the 90s and in post-2003 regime change. And you expressed that concern to Americans, I assume. What was their response? Uh, indeed, uh, this is a concern that uh, we have uh, as Kurdistan regional government and the pe and people of Kurdistan. Uh, we express that and, uh, and uh, in addition to that, um, the rights of uh, religious minorities, uh, which uh, uh, at a, a very um, uh, strong support of the Kurdish leaders at the time in 2004, um, it was inserted in the constitution that these religious minorities and ethnic minorities to, uh, to, to be mentioned in the constitution. So we are concerned that maybe the future constitution uh, will, will not entail that. And uh, there are many other aspects of the constitution which we feel in, not only infringe and undermine uh, the rights of uh, Kurdistan, but also 
uh, basic democratic rights of uh, Iraqis as a whole. Uh, these ideas or these concerns were expressed uh, and, um, and from what we felt that they uh, share our concerns. And so you're saying it's not only Kurdish rights that could be um, limited by the changes of the constitution but religious and other ethnic minorities as well? I believe so. Because protecting ethnic and religious minorities in the Middle East is a big concern of this administration. Um, you met with uh, Ambassador Brownback, who's the ambassador at large for international religious freedom here? Uh, indeed, indeed. We had uh, quite a few meetings at the State Department, at uh, Pentagon, White House, and on the Hill. And Ambassador Brownback, I know, is um, he appreciates the KRG's um, tolerance for different religions within the area. You discussed that with him? Uh, we discussed that at length, and uh, indeed they have uh, expressed appreciation uh, for what the uh, KRG has done so far. Uh, we um, expressed that we s it's out of conviction that we, we uh, have this uh, um, uh, open heart, open door policy uh, for Kurdistan to be a sanctuary to all ethnic groups, uh, be it uh, religious or ethnic groups, and uh, they, they are very much uh, supportive of our position and uh, there may be some programs in future that we can cooperate together. Well that would be terrific. I, I know that you went to Michigan and you met with the uh, Chaldean, Yazidi and Kurdish communities there? Yes, upon arrival last week um, I had uh, the opportunity to go to Detroit uh, whereby I met uh, some of the Yazidi uh, community and the Chaldean community uh, meeting the um, American Chaldean Chamber, uh, as well as the community leaders. Uh, and I must say, I was extremely impressed by it with the setup they have for themselves and the sense of belonging and strong bond that they have uh, for each other, helping each other. And uh, we discussed ways and means of, of maybe some of the business leaders can come to Kurdistan in order to look into ways and means of investing that would create certain job opportunities for the Christians uh, in Kurdistan uh, who have fled from Nainawa Plain to uh, Erbil and other areas. Unfortunately, many of them are considering migration. So hopefully with a uh, prospect of a better life and uh, business opportunities and job opportunities, um, they will stay put as indigenous people and as an important part of our society. Well, that sounds something like something that the Trump administration would very much support because they are committed to uh, maintaining the existence of these endangered Christian communities in the Middle East. Um, what about reconstruction in northern Iraq in Nineveh province? Did you, uh, was that an issue which you discussed with the American officials? Uh, previously, there has been uh, numerous programs in the Kuwait conference uh, uh, last year. Uh, but it hasn't taken off, uh, to be honest. Uh, first, um, there is no um, um, plan of action and the basic uh, or the immediate needs and the medium and long-term needs, uh, and as well as uh, stability and security, which uh, hinders any uh, implementation of such programs for reconstruction. Security, stability, and sadly, presence of certain militia forces in that area uh, has uh, uh, prevented uh, the communities to go back, uh, be it Yazidis and be it Christians. So, so long as uh, that stability and security is not prevailing, it will be very difficult to um, have a comprehensive uh, plan of rebuilding and reconstruction and, and uh, repatriation. So th these militias would be the hostile Shabi, is that uh, correct? Well, they are local militia, yes, they are from the two different communities uh, uh, who are actually uh, making life difficult for uh, the, the uh, original settlers of that area. Would you have an estimate of what percentage of the people who have been displaced as re internally displaced persons from Nineveh province, for example, and they've gone to Kurdistan, the living as refugees and displaced persons, what percentage of them have been able to go back so far about? Initially, um, at the uh, start of the onslaught of ISIS in uh, 2014, uh, we had, uh, or Kurdistan was hosting 
uh, up to 2 million uh, IDPs and refugees, uh, which amounted to 30% increase of our population. Uh, and of course, it was a huge burden uh, at the time when our budget was cut from Baghdad and we had 1,000 kilometer uh, front line of uh, war against uh, ISIS, which was very costly in human resources as well as financial resources. Um, and uh, obviously, we uh, did not turn these people away. Um, there were Christians, there were Yazidis, but also there were uh, Sunni Arabs from uh, Mosul, from Salah Hadim, from Tikrit, and from Anbar and other provinces. Uh, in more recent uh, last year and so, uh, the IDPs probably has halved now. Uh, there are still 850,000 IDPs living in Kurdistan, and about a quarter of a million Syrian refugees uh, are still in Kurdistan. Uh, in addition to the la uh, last uh, four weeks or so, we've had further 17,000 Syrian refugees coming to Kurdistan as a result of the events uh, across the border. Well, that sounds like a terrible situation, very great burden on the Kurdistan region. We will take a break now from our discussion with Minister Safin Dezai and be back shortly to continue our talk with him.